Well, good morning and welcome to the Betsy and Walter Stern Conference Center here at Hudson Institute. I'm Ken Weinstein, President and CEO of Hudson. No issue is more central to the national agenda than getting our fiscal house in order and restoring the economics of free enterprise and along with it, the growth and opportunity that has helped every new generation in American history aspire to do better than their parents. We're very fortunate to have Senator Bob Corker of Tennessee here with us today to address this critical issue. I know of no one better to address this issue in the U.S. Senate than he. Senator Corker has a unique background as a highly successful and self-made entrepreneur, someone who created a major construction business from scratch and then became a leading real estate investor, then someone who decided to leave the business world to use his skills as a public servant, first known really for spurring civic development as mayor of Chattanooga, Tennessee. Thanks to his hard work and attention to both principle and detail, the senator's appeal goes against normal political tides. He was elected as a Republican in Chattanooga, a city that normally elects Democrats. And in 2006, when the Democrats recaptured the House and the Senate and picked up six Republican Senate seats, Bob Corker was the only new Republican elected to the U.S. Senate. Though the Senate operates heavily on both prior seniority and precedent, Senator Corker decided to not become a quiet backbencher when he arrived in Washington in 2007. Drawing on his background in both uh, the worlds of business and finance, he gained immense respect from his colleagues, as well as coveted slots on the Senate Banking, Energy, and Foreign Relations Committees, among others, and very quickly became one of the lead players in the 2008-2009 auto industry bailout, promoting genuine industry reform in exchange for federal assistance. Accordingly, we're truly honored to hear from him today. The senator will speak briefly. He will then, he has then graciously agreed to take questions uh, from the audience and my colleague, uh, distinguished fellow Chris DeMuth, who has simply put one of the think tank world's leading experts on both regulation and political economy, will moderate the question and answer period. So let's give a warm Hudson Institute welcome to Senator Corker. Well, I am, uh, I'm thrilled to be here. I thank you all for coming out. I hope your lunch has been enjoyable. And uh, I just came from a hearing with uh, Chairman Bernanke where he does his every six-month Humphrey Hawkins meeting, which is far less important now that the Fed is on a regular basis talking with the public. But the kinds of questions you thought might be asked certainly were asked today. And, and uh, of course, not everybody had had the opportunity to ask the same questions uh, we continue to ask the chairman regarding uh, quantitative easing and on the other side of the aisle uh, additional stimulus. Last night um, I had an opportunity to do something that um, I, I do often and that is I attended a corporate board meeting and unfortunately because of the hyperactivity that's taking place here in Washington over the course of the last uh, many years uh, many quarterly board meetings are actually taking place here, and it's, a, it's an effort by the companies that these boards uh, are a part of to, to make sure that their board members understand what's happening in Washington, the impact that it has on their company. And, and again, I think that's somewhat unfortunate. Because of my background, um, I am often asked to come to these board meetings just to share uh, what I think is happening here in Washington and what I think the impact is going to be to their companies and you know I'm convinced more than ever that uh, especially today as we have a Humphrey Hawkins meeting where some people are pushing the Fed to do even more uh, it's evident to me by the way the Fed sort of out of tools right now and is really pushing rope uh, now as they continue to think about uh, additional uh, quantitative easing I think the best thing that we can do as a nation, uh, more than anything else that exists, is for us to really have fiscal reform. I think that a lot of people are talking this year about the tax cliff at the end of the year, and I think there's no question that that creates a, a degree of uncertainty. I don't think there's anybody in the Senate that believes that we're really going to have a $5 trillion tax increase at the end of the year. I think most people believe that something else is going to happen or something else quickly will retroactively happen to keep that from occurring. And so while I think that has an impact right now on our U.S. economy, to me the biggest issue by far is are we as a nation 
going to put in place the fiscal reforms that are necessary to become solvent as or to stay solvent as a nation. And I think that pales everything else from the standpoint of, of what is affecting these countries, uh, companies. I know we're going to talk, apparently your, your background is regulation. I'm sure we're going to talk a little bit about that. And I do believe that we've had uh, hyperactive regulation, especially recently, although it's been building for years. I don't think that has near the impact on slowing the economy as Congress's inability uh, to deal with fiscal reforms. Uh, for what it's worth, uh, you know, we've been debating platitudes uh, now in Washington for about two years as it relates to fiscal reforms. We've been talking about pro-growth tax reform coupled with entitlement reform. I attend a lot of meetings at night where uh, folks will come in from the business roundtable and there'll be 20 or so CEOs there and there'll be some senators there and everybody keeps talking about pro-growth tax reform and entitlement reform. But so far, there's actually, there's been no document to actually debate other than those two things, and those are pretty broad. And when you get into tax reform, it's my belief that uh, K Street is going to be hired like never before as corporations uh, debate what uh, pro-growth tax reform really is and which loopholes and which deductions ought to be done away with. So what we've done in our office over the last seven months, almost eight months now, is to write a bill that really addresses those issues. And so we have done that. Uh, we now are going throughout the Senate. Uh, I've got two meetings this afternoon with senators on the other side of the aisle to begin vetting it. We're obviously not uh, releasing the language yet, but we are, in fact, sitting down with senators going through what we believe is the appropriate balance relative to pro-growth tax reform and entitlement reform. Um, I think, for what it's worth, that sometime over the next six months to a year and a half, Congress is finally going to do its job, is going to act responsibly, and actually deal with this. I really believe that. As a matter of fact, uh, many citizens in our state last year uh, had some question as to whether I was going to actually seek re-election again. I, I, I think you have to ask yourself, and when you're my age, 59 years old, um, is what you're doing worth a grown man's time? And when you're in a body that fails to, to deal with the most essential issue that faces our country, uh, pales everything else comp pales compared to that, and you just don't see the will to actually rise up and deal with this issue, you have to question whether you're spending your time in a wise way. For what it's worth, I'm more optimistic than ever that we are going to deal with this issue, and certainly I want to be a part of that solution. I'm going to give one more uh, paragraph and then a close. Uh, you know, Arthur Brooks, um, at one of your competing or fellow uh, think tanks, uh, I think has done a really good job talking about uh, the Declaration of Independence and its impact on our nation. and. I think most of you are very familiar with the words uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, I was at a July 4th uh, celebration, I guess, a week and a half ago, and somebody, somebody read the Declaration of Independence in such an impassioned way, and then I was the next speaker. I felt uh, really embarrassed to even speak after this person had done such a great job. And, and yet what it did, it gave me the opportunity to talk about that. And the fact is that as our founders were putting together uh, the Declaration of Independence, they looked to the Commonwealth of Virginia. The Commonwealth of Virginia had used the words life, liberty, and the possession of property. And certainly the possession of property is an important thing, but our founders wisely knew that for our country to be the great country that it is, that Americans had to be in pursuit of a moral value, and that moral value was the pursuit of happiness. In Arthur's work, he's pointed out uh, how, you know, the, things that, the thing that makes people happier than anything else in a secular way is earned success, and that our free enterprise system, like no other system in the world, is the system that allows people to have that earned success. I think most of you, many of you know that there is a, a possibility uh, that this next year um, I may lead the Foreign Relations Committee on the Republican side. 
And I've traveled, uh, I've done a lot of extensive traveling. I try not to go to really nice places. People back in Tennessee really don't like reading about their senators being in Paris or some other place. And so I've been to a lot of what many people might call yucky places around the world. I think I've been to 46 or 47 countries, believe it or not, in the short time that I've been here. Almost no travel in the last year and a half because I'm actually in an election cycle now. But as I travel to those places, um, places where poverty is just incredible, what you'll see is, especially in Africa, women uh, on corner stands uh, marketing goods that they have created, trying to emulate this great free enterprise system that we have in this nation. And our nation has gone through a period of tremendous self-doubt since this financial crisis occurred. It really has. And I hear people saying things that I thought I would never hear as an American, and that is that we're not sure that future generations are going to have it as good as we've had it. I haven't heard those words candidly uh, in my lifetime until recent times where people see Congress not acting responsibly, where we see our free enterprise system under attack. Shockingly, even in the Republican presidential primary down in South Carolina, where the candidates, it was just almost an out-of-body experience to me to see that Republican presidential candidates were fighting each other over our free enterprise system. So for what it's worth uh, to those companies, to those companies who come here, uh, to the Americans who so depend on companies hiring them and and uh, them being employed, I do believe the, gr the greatest thing that we can do in Washington is, number one, deal with this fiscal issue. And as I've mentioned, uh, I'm very optimistic that that is going to happen. But then secondly, I think remember that moral value that was put in place, the pursuit of happiness, and remember that this great free enterprise system that we have uh, not only has benefited Americans, but it's helped lift hundreds of millions of people around this world out of poverty as they have tried to emulate us as a nation. And the last thing that we need to do as a great nation is to step back away from those values that have caused us to be where we are. I'm bullish on America right now. As I look at what is happening in the field of energy, which is so important, to our ability to make goods and to feel secure as a nation, an important natural resource. As I look at what has happened in the private sector um, over the last uh, few years, and as I look at, for instance, in Mexico, where they just elected a party uh, that is willing to look at their constitution, which says that you cannot have private investment uh, in the energy field. As I look at them being willing to change that, Look at the resources there, the resources in Canada, the resources that we have in this nation. We're at a position where over the next 10 or 12 years as a continent, we're going to be in a place where we really could be if, if handled properly in a situation we, where we are a net plus on fossil fuels. I look at the technological that breakthroughs that are taking place, the IPOs that continue to happen in this nation as our as our entrepreneurs continue to create new breakthroughs, as I look at what's happening in the pharmaceutical industry, and they continue again to, to have new breakthroughs that are making uh, not only Americans' lives better, but people's lives all over this world, I am very bullish. And I believe that as a nation, we are one fiscal reform deal away from putting this behind us and being able to focus again on being a great nation. Um, I really believe that. I believe that it's going to happen, and I want to do everything within my power as a United States senator, as one United States senator, to make that happen. And I know of nothing, no cause greater for all of you, for all Americans to be a part of over this next short period of time. Again, we're one reform deal away, in my opinion and being able to focus as a nation on continuing to be the great nation that we are. And I thank, uh, I thank the people of Tennessee for the privilege of being able to weigh in on their behalf. So with that, Chris, uh, if you want to uh, begin questioning, thank you for letting me be here. I'll do my best to be as transparent and clear as possible and when necessary, dodge. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. 
Uh, Senator, I, I'll, I'll take advantage of the fact that I've got the mic and ask you a question, and then we will go to the floor for questions and discussions. Uh, you are uh, one of the Senate's most important uh, overseers of matters of banking and finance, and a lot of people think that you're uh, the, senators, the Senate's uh, uh, reigning uh, expert by far on these matters. Uh, in the last couple of years, along with the very good things that you have mentioned in the private sector, we've seen a, a, a long uh, succession of scandals in uh, banking and uh, finance on the front pages almost every week. Is this not a blot on the reputation of the private enterprise uh, system? Uh, as somebody who has followed these matters, uh, how do you respond to them and how do you respond to those that say this requires uh, much uh, more uh, aggressive uh, federal regulation of the financial industry? Well, it's a pretty heavy question. Um, Just to get things I meet, uh, uh, as I mentioned, sometimes uh, corporations will ask me to come and meet with them and talk about what I think is happening and what I think is the best thing for us to do as a nation to move ahead, and I'm, I'm honored by that. Also, from time to time, just recently, I met with, uh, I guess, 15 of the CEOs of the largest entities in our nation financially, and I told them that they were their own worst enemy. And, uh, and I think it's the conduct that you're referring to that uh, uh, causes me to say that. I mean, uh, uh, it's, it's, you know, look, we, uh, there's a lot of money that's swashing around in these entities. Um, you have a lot of people that are there. Many of these entities are highly complex. Uh, some of the entities are highly complex because they used to be partnerships and now they've gone public because right. of regulatory changes, candidly, that actually prompted uh, some of the firms that used to be partnerships and have a very different culture. Uh, now, because of uh, you know some legislation that went in place in 1999, they've gone public, and the culture is much different and much more short-term in focus. But uh, look, I, I think in a, in a free market economy, you're always going to have uh, bad actors. I, I think one of the concerns, and I, and I agree that we should be vigilant as it relates to regulation to try to to route that out, but I think that um, um, I'm just going to throw a, a, a point out here. I, I think one of the things that we need to consider is um, we don't what we need to look at regulating markets. Um, our if you look at our financial system, only about a third of the financial transactions take place in the in the regulated formal markets. Two thirds of it takes place outside of that, and I think there's been a focus recently on almost putting a bank examiner beside every banker. And for what it's worth, uh, a, a banker is always going to be ahead of a regulator because the regulator is using the information provided by the banker to react. And so I just, uh, we're going to have bad actors. Bad actors give the, the, the markets uh, and give these companies and give the system itself a very bad name. And uh, we should be vigilant, but I think our regulation uh, should be more around transparency, uh, you know, uh, understanding in real time what's happening with many of the derivatives. I'm, I'm supportive of some of the many of the measures to to create uh, clearing houses and exchanges and those types of things. And I think we need to continue down that path. But at the end of the day, uh, what we don't want to do is squash out uh, this great free enterprise system. We need to remember that. Um, as we look at the nation's uh, 15 largest institutions, we're, I don't think we have a financial institution in that. We have three of the 15, and most of them are on the back side of that. So we're in a global world. These institutions are awfully large. We certainly need to be vigilant. But what we also need to know is that we've got to have a pretty sophisticated and large uh, financial system to accommodate the economic growth of this great nation, the largest GDP in the world. So uh, I agree, bad actors are giving the financial system a bad name, and we need to punish the heck out of people who violate laws, and uh, at the same time, uh, not do, do so for political reasons, but because something actually has happened uh, that is in violation of laws that we have. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, look around. I'm going to start uh, in the front row. Heavy. And if you could please wait uh, until the microphone arrives, and if you could introduce yourself, uh, please, before your question. Hi, Senator. I'm Tevi Troy, a senior fellow here. 
Uh, thank you for your remarks, and I'm glad to hear you're optimistic and bullish on America. I think the rule of politics is that the optimistic candidate always wins. In terms <laughs> of my, my question, I'm a little worried about regulations. There are some estimates that say the cost of regulations is about a trillion dollars a year. The Obama health care law has already 12,000 pages of regulations and counting. Right. But on the other hand, you hear Cass Sunstein, who has the job that Chris did as regulatory czar at, at OMB, say that the cost of regulations is only about $60 billion. I say only yeah. in quotes, yeah. I guess, and that uh, he keeps cleaning up the reg code and regulations are going away. What's the real story there, and what can we do about it? Well, from my perspective, the real story is that, uh, you know, that we are in a climate of tremendous overregulation and wrong-headed regulation. But let me, let me sort of take it back a step. I, I think that the election that we're having this year, not my race, but the presidential race, obviously, I think I really do believe that regardless of which side of the aisle you're on, that this is the most important election since 1980. If you are a limited government person who wants appropriate regulation, and I think all of us understand markets function best when they're appropriately regulated. I mean, you want uh, people that are actually uh, handling their financial uh, matters in a good way want to keep out bad actors. Uh, but I think this election, if you're on the limited government side, is the most important election personally since 1980. If you're on the side on the Cass Sunstein side, where you want to see tremendous government involvement in every activity of life, and you want to consider, you want to continue to see growth in government as it relates to dealing with many of the matters that everyday Americans deal with. If you want to see growth in that, this again is the most important election since 1980 because I think four more years of what's happening certainly is going to cause much of what's happened over the last three and a half years to be even more permeated throughout our system. So this is a very, very important election, and it's kind of amazing. As I'm out there, uh, it doesn't feel like to me that people yet have gotten that. Um, you know, it seems to be on both sides of the aisle for both candidates right now, not the excitement yet and not the really the realization by Americans as to how important this is. So obviously I think, uh, I think Cass is a little off base and I think if he were here he would say that I'm a little off base but uh, I think that uh, the heavy hand of government no doubt has damaged our economy over the last several years. I think even though it's damaged our economy I think in, in large ways. I mean matter of fact I'll digress for a second and say that you know Dodd-Frank was rushed through in order to meet, create certainty in the markets. It will be at least two or three more years before all of the rules are promulgated around Dodd-Frank. And so what we've done at a time when you really want credit to flow is we've created far more uncertainty. I was with actually a bank from Tennessee last night, First Tennessee Bank, their $25 billion asset bank. And candidly, you know, they don't know what the rules of the road are going to be. Do you think they're taking risk? Uh, right now, they're not doing that, and that's the way most companies are. So I think that you'd have to say that the regulatory regime that we've been through over the last several years, no question, has added to the uncertainty. It slowed our economy, and candidly, may, do the, may be the president's undoing. I still think the biggest issue is our inability to deal with our nation's solvency and to put that in our rearview mirror. Senator Hyde, uh, Chris Sands also here at Hudson and uh, originally from Detroit. And you popped on my radar with the auto bailouts, asking some very tough questions of the companies that. I think I would have a degree of difficulty running for statewide office in Michigan. <laughs> so. I wanted to ask you how you feel about the bailouts, how they've gone, where yeah. do you think the auto industry is now, and what can we do yeah. to yeah. get it back on track? Well, you know, I've stayed in touch. Uh, uh, you know, Alan Mulally at Ford was one of my heroes throughout the process, and I really have a lot of respect for him. And, and uh, you know, we actually, people don't realize it, but we have a GM plant in Tennessee. We also have Nissan, and we have Volkswagen. And we recruited Volkswagen to our state, and, and they actually came to a site that I had built while I was mayor. Two of the three meetings with Volkswagen uh, were at my dining room table in Chattanooga. I've missed a few votes. I'm sorry. But, um, um, you know, so I've stayed very closely in touch. I would say, uh, number one, that I think the debate that we had 
that wasn't going to happen, by the way. I remember the three CEOs came in and asked for $25 billion and said, you know, by the way, we'll decide how we're going to divide it up based on market share. That was the first meeting. I think the debate that ensued um, has had a huge positive impact on Detroit. I think that they were looked at in ways that they never thought they were going to be looked at through that process. So I think that has been healthy. I think uh, uh, I'm being somewhat, since you brought it up, I'll be somewhat braggadocious, but say that I think the Corker principles, the five that were laid out during the banking hearing, were a part of Hank Paulson's package, even though they were non-binding. And I think the administration, as they came in, used those five principles to constantly talk with journalists and others to say that they were not just doing a giveaway uh, program to the, to the auto company. So I think that was positive. What I think was not positive was the prearranged bankruptcy process that uh, gave such sway to the UAW and away from the bondholders, uh, many of which had used these bonds as part of their retirement program. And so I thought that was, in fairness, politically motivated. I talked to folks in the administration, uh, names I won't uh, give at this time, but you know, their response to me was, well, Corker, you know, um, we've decided that that uh, you know, it's very important for us to have workers there, and if we tried to go a different route, we don't think uh, they would show up. I thought that was incredibly naive and never would have happened. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, I don't think that was actually the case. And if you remember, it really it wasn't about wages at that time in the bankruptcy process. They honored the existing contract with UAW. New hires came in at a different rate. Of course, that's being watered down right now. But, uh, and by the way, that was one of the provisions that we had asked, that they just be competitive. As determined, by the way, by Obama's labor person, which, you know, you, you think they were going to give a degree of flexibility in what competitive was. So I think it's helped reshape the industry. I do still have concerns about the culture um, within especially GM, I, I, I still feel, I think they're wrestling. Uh, I, I think, you know, they've been given a, the, the, the U.S. taxpayers have given GM a lease on life. And um, I do think that, you know, the people who've come in to run the entity um, are trying to do a decent job. Europe is still use, losing tons of money. Um, but I think that what I see on the ground is the culture still has not changed. It's very evident that the difference, there's a huge chasm between management uh, and the employees there. It's almost as if they're two different entities when you visit uh, one of their facilities. Something that I've just never witnessed in my life. Um, you know, I had a company and... You know, it was like, a, certainly it wasn't the size of GM, obviously, and, but I've been in many, many other companies. I've served on corporate boards. I don't think I've ever witnessed the degree of separation between the employees and their attitudes and management. Uh, and it's almost as if, uh, candidly, uh, GM management genuflex, uh, you know, towards the labor leaders that are there. So I think that over time they've got to build a unified entity or they're going to be back in the same position they're in. And uh, I think the beginnings of that, candidly, uh, possibly a tilt of that way was, was the deal that was made in the prearranged bankruptcy. Yes, sir. I'm not supposed to call yes, people. Yes. I'd like to, to turn the question a little bit, although I am also a fellow, but a MacArthur fellow. <laughs> so You're a what fellow? A MacArthur fellow. Yeah. The, the so-called genius. Right. I'm going to give you this, ma'am. Young lady, I'm going to give you this so you can be ambidextrous here. But I, I'd like to ask you about, uh, as far as free enterprise goes, what about level playing fields? Because, for example, I am a nurse midwife, and I've developed the freestanding birth center movement, which began in 1975, and now there are about 230 operating around the country. We save inordinate amounts of money for the system, and yet we have a great deal of trouble. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure what role regulation plays in this. I know, Senator, that you're very friendly to the nurse midwives in Tennessee because they've told me about that. Um, but I, I'm just wondering how you see 
a, a young profession like we are. Of course, we're not young. We're, we were there with Moses. But um, <laughs> how you see us getting ahead without regulation, yeah. how you can keep yeah. the playing field level. Yeah. Well, I'd say two things. Number one, that, that um, our, our medical delivery system um, is going to be under, under increasing pressure as we move ahead, right? I mean, there's just, there, I don't think there's any question about that. Um, I'll just give you one stat that I, I, like to leave, I like to use back home in town hall meetings, just one stat on Medicare. The average family in America over their lifetime in 2012 dollars will pay into the Medicare system uh, $119,000, including, and that includes the part that they're that their employer pays on their behalf. I think most people understand that half of it's paid by the employee, half of it by the employer. That's in 2012 dollars. That same family, two wage earner family making the average wage, takes out of the Medicare system in 2012 dollars, 357,000. So you got 119 going in, 357 going out. And I know looking at this in highly intelligent audience, uh, you know, you you know, you can't make that up with volume. That's a real problem. And unfortunately, unfortunately, volume is on the way. There, are t I'm 59, and there are 20 million more Americans my age that are coming onto that system with that tremendous imbalance as far as money coming in and money going out. It's an incredible dilemma, and something that we have to address as a nation. So as we move ahead, midwives and other delivery systems, candidly, there's going to be pressure to include them far more into the system as people try to figure out more and better ways of, of delivering care. As far as the regulation goes, thankfully, as you mentioned, midwives like me for some reason, and I, of course, like them. But, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but the fact is that those regulations do not really take place at the federal level. They're generally at the state level. And generally, there's a rub between the, the, the medical societies that exist in those states, uh, made up of physicians, and others who are delivering uh, other means or wanting greater ability to, to have other means of delivery. So the regulatory piece really is more at the state level. I don't think there are many federal regulations that keep that from happening. Um, but the fact is there's going to be increasing pressure uh, for us to allow uh, lesser expensive and high quality delivery systems to exist. There may be somebody shaking their head back there. There may be some regulation that I'm not aware of at the federal level that's, that's keeping you down, but I think most of it takes place at the state level. So lobby the state. Yes. Yes, sir. Mark Carr with Channel Design Group. Thanks for uh, coming here. I've you. followed your career for a while. Going back to philosophy a little bit, uh, you know, the Declaration of Independence, unless I'm mistaken, isn't the law of the land like the Constitution. Right. And I've heard uh, Brooks talk, and a, a brilliant guy. Uh, but I'm wondering if you could reflect a little bit on the difference between that document and the Constitution as far as folks framing you know what we're about and how our institutions are organized and thought through yeah so i would say uh, uh very briefly that you know it's kind of like the declaration is a uh vision statement and uh you know the the constitution is the actual document that lays out uh uh, you know the the laws of the land, or the you know the 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 rights of individuals in the laws of the land. So I think they're two two very different documents. Not unlike uh, you know what happens in a company where they have a mission statement, if you will, and then there are there are actual procedures and rules through which the company operates and has a code of conduct and all of that. So to me, they're they're different uh, in that way, and there's no question that. That, uh, in my opinion, anyway, um, the constitutional provisions that have been put forth certainly. Um, look, I'm not saying this to use hyperbole. I'm not saying that. I think I don't think you've actually heard me make a partisan comment today. I typically don't. I come from a business background, and all I want to do is solve our nation's problems. I, I found that going down to the Senate floor and lamb blasting the other side doesn't necessarily aid much in trying to solve a problem. And so I try not to do that unless it's 
uh, that's what I will tell you the last several years um, I really am worried about the constitutional balance that exists here in our nation I really am and and uh, it just seems like that what's happening is that and this has been going on by the way for a long time but the executive branch um, is assume has assumed more and more and more power the legislative branch less and less power and as i mentioned it's possible that uh that i might be the person who's head of foreign relations on the republican side this next time one of the main main and primary objectives that i will have if that's the case is to reassert uh, the Senate's role in foreign policy decisions, which obviously, I mean, the, sen the Senate has been totally feckless, in my opinion, since I've been in the United States Senate for the last five and a half years on foreign policy issues. And we've allowed ourselves to be irrelevant. We are irrelevant, mostly, uh, to the process. And to me, the con one, of the one of the main provisions of the Constitution is that balance of power, which I, I have seen uh, greatly dissipate. You know, a lot of people are questioning why Republicans didn't rise up at the end of last year um, when we had this issue of the uh, NLRB appointees, by the way, which had just been sent up like a few days before. And then we had these recess appointments. It wasn't as if these folks had been held forever. I mean, literally, there had been no hearing about them and of course the problem is if the senate takes a, a vote on whether this is uh you know violates the constitution what's going to happen well the one side of the aisle is going to say it is and one side of the aisle is going to say that it isn't and it's actually going to hurt a future case and so what what the minority in the senate decided to do after that provocation is to wait until there's actually a court case that challenges what the NLRB is doing because these people were placed in service unconstitutionally and to join that with a brief which is what we're doing right now and to have to attack it if you will from the outside but uh, I really am concerned about the checks and balances I'm concerned about the fact that Congress really is, has not assumed its legitimate role for some time but especially recently and as one individual, I want to do everything I can to change that dynamic so that Congress truly is equal to the legislative, to the executive branch, which candidly has not been the case for a long, long time. I'm going to go over here and then there. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Michael Krause, George Mason Law School. I'm um, intrigued, Senator, by your optimism. I'm happy that you're very optimistic that we'll solve the fiscal problem, but of course one observes in Europe that uh, there wasn't a problem in Greece until the problem became acute, and there wasn't a problem in Spain until until uh, the bankruptcy became evident. And uh, I'm one of those who believes, and I'm interested in your views on this, that we're not necessarily in a better position fiscally than, say, Spain, when all things are considered, especially the state's yeah. pension obligations and the rest. So. Why are you, I'm happy that you're optimistic. Yeah. Why are you optimistic that we'll deal with this so well? Well, I, I don't think it, look, I've lived a pretty rough and tumble life business-wise. Uh, the kind of life, my, kind, my business was a pretty, pretty tough business to be in all of that time. And, you know, we operated around the country. And, and I, I don't think that I'm Pollyanna uh, or being Pollyannish when I say that I feel something brewing. I know there are a lot of Washington watchers, and I know that in a group like this, this is probably some of the most astute Washington watchers that exist, because while you have other lives, you obviously pay attention to what's happening on the Hill. Um, I feel something brewing, and I think the frustrations there have reached a level that that uh, is, is very high. Republicans, I've never been in the majority. I've been here five and a half years. I have no idea what it would be like to set the agenda. Um, I call myself back home, you know, the BASF of the Senate. You know, we don't make the products you use. We just try to make them better. And, uh, um, but yet I feel, I feel while there's frustration on our side of the aisle, I think there's even greater frustration on the Democratic side because they are setting the agenda and they know they're not solving our nation's problems. I think there's enough uptake as to what the solution is what the general ingredients of a solution is. I really believe that, that soon we will act. Now, I know there's a lot of folks, Washington watchers, that think we're going to have to have a crisis like you've seen in Europe 
to force us to action first. And I keep, and I think people generally understand that that type of crisis is far worse than the one we went through in 2008 as far as displacement of people and what it does to their lives. So um, I just feel something brewing. I could be well wrong and my optimism uh, misplaced. I, I don't just say that to be glad handing. It would be very difficult for me to get up in the morning and do what I do if I didn't have some degree of optimism that we're going to solve this problem. I have it. It's real. I think that we will. I think I have a lot of conversations with Mitch and others. I think that Mitch McConnell, um, if he ends up being the majority leader, and who knows what's going to happen, uh, you know, there's really no momentum on either side of the aisle right now electorally. I think it's kind of like a dead wind out there, and it's just mano against mano in each of these races. But I do think that Mitch, if he's the person, um, is absolutely committed uh, to dealing with this fiscal issue during the first two years that he's there. Um, I see lots of other evidence of people knowing that it needs to be done. And to make a contribution towards that end, instead of debating platitudes uh, in our office, where we actually have developed the real legislative language, which we think is necessary. Uh, to deal with this. To your point about Europe, there's no question if you look to debt to GDP overall as European Union, we are worse off than the European Union. There is no question, no question about that. And uh, um, debt to GDP overall, we are worse off than they are. Now, the, the, obviously there's disparate issues. The North is better off than the South, but I'm talking about on average, uh, our debt to GDP issues make us worse off in that regard. Um, and uh, and we need to deal with the issue. Yes. Up, up front, please. Uh, John, John Solid, an independent economist. Senator Corker, isn't a large part of the fiscal problem the fact that government has gotten too big and that it's so big that it perhaps is hurting the moral fiber of the country, the too many supplicants, whether they be crony capitalists, crony labor, crony whatever. That's question one. Two, what percentage of GDP should be accounted for by the federal government? So uh, to point to... First was a softball. Second was a little curve. No, I think, uh, well, look, if you look at the 40-year post-entitlement uh, period, it's been 20.6% of our GDP, right? Um, you know, I mean, basically for the last 40 years on average, we've operated with about 18% uh, of our GDP going into government coffers and us spending 20.6%. And with growth, as long as growth is more than 2.6%, than then you have growth to, uh, to deal with that gap. I don't like that formula, by the way. I mean, I, like for it to, I, I would like to see us truly get to a point where it's dead even, but I know there are a lot of people that debate that some degree of deficit spending is, is, uh, is okay. I, I, I'm not one of those. So to me, uh, we've established that 20.6% has been the post-entitlement period amount. Uh, today we're spending about 24.5% of GDP, so I would argue, yes, we're about 20% at least uh, taking in 20% more than, than, than we should be taking in relative to our economy. Uh, you can debate that number and say, well, you know, growth is slower right now. Maybe, maybe that number is a little skewed, but there's no question that we are taking in more than we should. I think the best answer, though, is to say to you, um, I got an email from a very wealthy, I got two emails actually, from very wealthy individuals in our state. Very wealthy individuals. I voted, uh, I am dismayed that the United States Senate with Republican help has voted three times to violate the Budget Control Act that was just put in place last August. The whole nation watched as we almost, as government almost came to a halt and we negotiated a debt ceiling increase that had with it the Budget Control Act. And I am absolutely dismayed and astonished that people on my side of the aisle, my friends and colleagues, have aided in violating that now at least three times. Uh, to me, if we cannot adhere, we're going to spend $45 trillion over the next 10 years of your money. If we cannot adhere to a modest diminishment of discretionary spending of $900 billion over the next 10 years, 
We don't deserve to serve. I'm sorry. It's unbelievable to me that we have not been able to adhere to that. So I obviously, based on these statements, I'm sure you can tell, I'm voting against bills that violate that. And I'm just dismayed that my friends on the other side would go along with it. By the way, my friends that I'm working with on an overall uh, fiscal reform package. So, But I'm, also, I'm more dismayed that our guys are doing it. So I got an email. Um, uh, two emails from two wealthy individuals who said they will never, ever, ever again support me because I voted against a bill that puts food on their table. And these are wealthy individuals. These are people that should know better. These are people that, that no matter what happens for the rest of their life are going to be financially well off and they would rather put their own selfish interest ahead of our nation. So I think absolutely we've gotten to a point where, you know, crony capitalism, uh, supplicants, our nation, unfortunately, is becoming tilted to be a nation of supplicants. The Senate, candidly, and many of the things, the question that was asked earlier about the Constitution, I mean, the Senate in some ways is that way, but, but uh, I am uh, discouraged by that. And no, that's why I get back to the fact that this is, I believe, the most important election since 1980. And we can either go down the path of moving away from the a nation of supplicants, okay, to, or we can go great, more greatly down that path. I really do think this is a very defining race for people on both sides of the aisle. People on both sides of the aisle have a lot at stake in this race. And I hope that by the time the election occurs, uh, people will understand the great importance uh, of this race. Yes, sir. Standing. Yes, Senator Corker. Brian Summers, Jesse Helms Foundation. A question on the um, sea treaties. I wanted to find out your position being on foreign relations, yeah. where you stand at uh, helping to preserve or protect our sovereignty uh, and our rights uh, around the world. Yeah. So uh, we obviously are getting a ton of emails regarding the Law of the Sea Treaty, and I think Portman and Ayotte's announcements yesterday put an end to anybody thinking that the Law of the Sea Treaty is going to happen this year. It's been around for three decades now. Um, I don't think it's ever had a vote on the Senate floor, and I don't understand why it's even pushed. I don't, I don't think the administration even cares about the Law of the Sea Treaty. At least that's the indications that I get for some reason. Uh, my friend Senator Kerry uh, is pushing this, and again, I don't think the administration cares one way or another whether it even comes to a vote this year. A lot of people have asked why I haven't taken a position yet on the treaty, and the reason is that uh, like everything else that I do, including somebody mentioned the auto deal, I mean, I went up and met with an analyst and understand, understood the supplier chains and I think I knew more about GM's balance sheet than Wagner did when he, I really do, I mean seriously, than, than when he came to testify. So with the Law of the Sea Treaty, it's a long treaty. Um, it's got lots of annexes and, and appendixes, and uh, I, I just uh, I haven't finished going through it yet. We've had three hearings. I'm very pessimistic about it. I'm not sure what's even driving it coming here, but I'd like to finish the process like I do with everything else. Uh, before I take a position. So as I tell people back home, and again, we're getting a lot of emails on this topic, please let me be the same person I've been on every other topic, and that is understand this thing from A to Z before I take a position. Again, I'm skeptical for lots of reasons, one of which is the, the climate issue. Um, I'm skeptical about uh, tribunals. I'm skeptical about uh, some of the sovereign issues that you've mentioned uh, with your not neutral approach to this when you ask the question. But, uh, but I, I, you know, again, it's not going to come up this year. I, I don't see any way that it's going to be a cent. And, and what we really need to focus on at the end of the year, Kerry's already committed to not bring it up for a vote prior to the election. So what that means is he, he might want to take two weeks up on the Senate floor with the treaty. Uh, to me, what we need to be focused on after the election, if not before, is this fiscal issue I just talked about. I mean, that's the issue of the day. The law of the sea treaty has been around, as I mentioned, for three decades. It doesn't seem to be working so well right now as China and Taiwan have issues out in the South China Sea, both of which are signatory to this issue. So it seems to me this is something we ought to take up down the road. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the senator has time for a few more questions, and I'm going to take one in the front and one in the back, and we'll see where we are. Yes, sir. Milton Grunfeld, citizen. Um, it seems to me that all of our economic problems have to have a good, strong industrial base to solve them. We can't right. just redistribute things, right. and regulations would help. But I, I do think, as do many people, that we need some kind of border-adjusted value-added tax, basically an import duty, to restore America's manufacturing, because we can't work our way out of these problems unless we, we're actually working to make things. Yeah. So that's just a statement that I well, can acknowledge. You, you know, we, we uh, um, to get ready for this year in, Republicans are having uh, smart people come in every week at, I think it's 4.30 on Wednesdays, we're having people come in and talk about tax policy. Numbers of them have advocated what you just said. What I would say to you is that may well be the truth, and when you think about something like that, it's not, it's not foreign in thinking to what many people have said about the fair tax, right? I mean, people, you've had a whole movement that took place a few years ago where people wanted to do away with income tax and just have a, a tax on consumption, and so it's not particularly foreign to that thinking. I think the realities of it politically are that today... Uh, you know, the, the topic of the day, the focus of the Senate and the House, I think, is on pro-growth reform, where basically, not that VAT taxes aren't pro-growth reform, I'm not being pejorative when I say that, but I think the focus today is on trying to eliminate a large portion of the $1.2 trillion in credits, loopholes, and subsidies that exist and lower everybody's marginal rates. Um, it may be that a VAT tax comes into the to the discussion as people try to figure out a way, by the way, to lower corporate rates down to 25 percent. I know people are figuring out that's going to be difficult to get to a place that we ought to get to, but it's not really in the political mainstream right now. It may get there over time, but uh, I do understand your point. I've had lots of smart people like you uh, advocating uh, that position. I just don't think it's, uh, it's, it's ready for prime time yet here in our country as far as people's uptake. People like you may make it that way over, over the next several years. Another question? Somebody had their hand up yes. back here. Gentleman in the back, yes. Okay, Kevin Bainey uh, with the Center for Global Prosperity. I was wondering what the best course of action would be for navigating budget sequestration. Specifically, should military cuts and social program cuts go through together? That's a great question, and uh, we had a debate about this. Uh, uh, there were eight of us sitting around in our normal Monday uh, afternoon meeting at five. So here's what's happening. It's a, it's a very, very timely question and one that uh, is going to generate a lot of emotion on both sides of the aisle. I think most of you know, again, to set the backdrop, um, you know, as part of the Budget Control Act, we had $900 billion in discretionary spending caps that were put in place over the next 10 years. By the way, that don't really reduce spending. They just reduce the growth in spending. I mean, only Washington can deal with things in that manner. Another part of that was the creation of a super committee, six Republicans and six Democrats, that were to come up with an additional $1.2 trillion in spending reductions over the next 10 years, all of which added up to $2.1 trillion, which was the increase in debt ceiling. And if you remember, John Boehner famously went to New York to give a speech and said, well, you know, we'll raise the debt ceiling. Whatever we raise the debt ceiling by, we've got to reduce spending by, which, by the way, for what it's worth, if you do the math, if, a, if as a nation we actually did that, believe it or not, in 10 years you'd have a balanced budget. It's an amazing thing if you do the math. So it wasn't, as it turned out, it wasn't really a bad idea. Well, the super committee met and unbelievably, unbelievably, again, we're going to spend $45 trillion of your money over the next 10 years. We could not achieve an agreement of $1.2 trillion. And so a very draconian measure was put in place as a part of that before the super committee was set up to, to force these people to act, our people to act, very qualified folks, by the way. And that was this sequestration. And so half of it is coming out of defense, half of it is coming out of social programs. Uh, because we count the interest that we would save, again, to make it easier on ourselves, the actual cut this next year is not $120 billion, 
but it's $108 billion. And so there's a debate right now over what we do. Let me just tell you from my perspective, and I hope this is, if it ha have any effect on the process, uh, I hope this is tweeted out everywhere, okay? The last thing we should do as a nation is to do away with the sequestration process. We either need to come up with another solution that's real or let it take place because the greatest threat to our nation is our own inability to deal with our fiscal issues. It pales everything else. And so what's happening right now, there are negotiations that are happening. Um, I, I know who the negotiators are, and therefore I'm talking with them constantly. But if we're going to do the 108, if we're going to figure out another way, and by the way, the easiest way, in my opinion, to deal with the sequestration issue is to come up with a sensible $1.2 trillion package, which is what the, the super committee was supposed to do, okay? The, the, one of the most difficult ways of doing it is to find, you know, what they're now looking for is $108 billion this next year. Well, that's kind of hard to do. It, it, in many ways, it's harder than the big package, okay? It really is when you sit down and do the math to actually have $108 billion in reductions next year is kind of tough because what you do when you start getting these reductions, they build over time. You all understand about baselines and all of that. And so if you start cutting, the number grows geometrically over time. What I'm worried about right now is that Congress unbelievably irresponsibly unbelievably irresponsibly may come up with a solution where we say we're going to save that money over 10 years like we always do the same cbo trick that has gotten our country in the place that it is so in my opinion we either need to come up with a big package 1.2 come up with 108 billion dollars in reductions other places that are real this next year and not spread over 10 or we need to let it happen because to me by kicking the can down the road, we're creating even greater lack of credibility with the markets, with the American people. And um, um, I just, uh, I hope we'll come up with a big solution. I know we probably won't before November. Um, the best thing that can happen in the process, obviously, is for these companies, these companies that have lots of employees that they have given notices to about layoffs, that's part of the defense mechanism uh, code of law, um, uh, those notices have to go out 60 days in advance. They can send them out earlier, but just to let politicians know what the effect of that is going to be. But again, um, I will strongly oppose, strongly oppose, laying the railroad track, okay, over any changes that, that <coughs> cause us to kick this down the road and not deal with it in an appropriate way. And I know that there have to be a lot of people in this room that disagree with that, but I still think it's our greatest threat, and what we don't need to do is is uh, is not deal with it now. Senator Corker, um, I have to keep you on schedule. That sounded like the voice of God coming <laughs> from <over> there. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I I think it's time to uh, to conclude, and I would like to thank you for spending your lunch hour with us today. Uh, and uh, and to th and to thank you for your very penetrating and I must say really inspiring uh, remarks. Yeah, thank great you. It's great to be with you. Thank you very much. <laughs>